Before I start, I just want to say a big thank you to Dave Adams for the invitation to um, present on the National Coaches Conference, albeit a, a virtual one and a very unique situation. My name is Damien Roden. I'm currently Director of Performance at Anderlecht. I'm just going to talk to you about my experience in, um, in the MLS. I spent a couple of seasons with Seattle Sounders and I'm going to just present a little case study of my work there. We ended up winning the, uh, the 2019 MLS Cup and one of the most um, fantastic experiences of my, of my career to date. Okay, in terms of the presentation then, I'm going to give you an idea of where we were when, um, when I first started, where we wanted to go based on discussions with the general manager and the manager, how we got there and things that, that were put in place, um, and ultimately the outcome. What, what happened as a result. So I, I went over in April 2018, um, six or seven games into the MLS season. The, the previous season, the, the team had reached the MLS Cup final, but been well beaten. And from conversations with the general manager and, and the manager, they felt that they were outplayed and um, physically outrun. So there was a, a desire to improve the physicality of the team. And also there were a couple of players, key players that were missing through injury. And, and it was, again, a desire to, to try and um, improve player availability, certainly going into the playoffs. So as I said, when I arrived, there'd been a key injury to the star player, Jordan Morris, who's, um, who's recently, you know, unfortunately had the same injury with, with Swansea City. Um, he was a big miss, very, very powerful, explosive um, player, big influence on the team. Um, there'd also been a number of soft tissue injuries during the, the preseason campaign. So limited player availability going into the season. And it was, it was the worst start to the MLS campaign that, that they'd had, certainly in their recent history. As you can see from the, the image there, amazing stadium, lots of amazing stadiums in the States, but this is the Seattle Seahawks stadium where the Seattle Sounders played. So given that amazing, fantastic facility, I was expecting a little bit uh, more in terms of facilities at the training ground. So I was, I was quite surprised when I realized there's one grass field and one artificial field. Um, the gymna gymnasium that the players used was a shared gymnasium with um, a rehab clinic. And there were very limited recovery facilities. Um, and obviously coming from the Premier League, being a bit spoilt and having lots and lots of things in place and trying to keep you know, all, the, all the assets fit and healthy. I again, I was surprised a little bit on, there was no breakfast provision. Um, there wasn't any real formal screening performed at the start of the season. So give you an idea of you know, players' strengths and weaknesses to to develop programs and, and improve their physicality. Um, there wasn't any really formal structure in terms of player assessment. It was more speaking to players, um, no formal activation before training. Obviously the activation of, of players before training has come into the game quite a lot in the last you know, four or five years, but it was more players did it off their own back. Um, and there was lacking any real intensity training. So it was important that um, we, we examined why and, and went about our business to, to try and improve that. So where did you want to go? As I said, the, the main emphasis from the general manager and the manager was we wanted to increase the intensity and make players more competitive and improve player, player availability. I think that's what everybody wants to do, but there was a movement and a desire to put a structure in place to do that strategically. And ultimately increase the level of professionalism, bring a lot of things that um, were in place in Europe, in the Premier League, and, and try and filter those into the MLS. So how do we get there? Um, the first thing that, that for me was important, that if we wanted to increase the intensity of play, then we had to put in place all the support mechanisms. So nutrition, for me, being a very, very big one, making breakfast and lunch compulsory. It didn't go down great at the, at the start. But we try to explain to players, look, if, if we're going to push you every day, you have to have fuel in your body and you have to help your body recover. So we, we try to educate them about that. Um, and then we erected a, um, a tent area equipped with gym equipment. So, I mean, it wasn't fantastic, but it was a space adjacent to um, the area where the, the players change, where the medical facilities were, 
where the meeting rooms were. So it was just an area where we could start doing the things that we wanted to do without walking to an area or a facility that was shared and you couldn't necessarily use all the space. Um, and then <clears throat> we started implementing what, what I call readiness assessments. I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about the type. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when we go through the, the typical week, it was ultimately to see where players were after every game. Highlight any red flags, any interventions that were needed so that when we wanted to really push them, we were confident that we could push them. And then, as I said, we made the, the activation exercises compulsory. So we had a really good group of um, practitioners that understood if, we, if we've got a light session and the players are less mobile, what type of work to do. If we've got a really hard session, it's very loads and loads of sprinting, what to do to prepare the players for, for that type of activity. And then we implemented a, a periodization model. So it was ideally to improve player availability first and foremost, and then the physical capacity. So they were improving all season. Um, one of the key difficulties initially was educating the players about the change because it was a very, very new concept, but also educating the coaching staff about the, the intricate details of, of the model. I was fortunate that um, we had Gonzalo Pineda and Jimmy Traore that were, were going through the Welsh course. So in their um, attendance and, and development, it became a lot more easy to implement the model because they were, they were understanding how everything fits in through their education through the, through the courses. So it took a little bit of time, but then um, it started to materialize. And ultimately, it's, it's trying to say it's not about opinions, it's not about this, it's not about that, it's, it's about players being available. And I'm a big believer that in any team, in any league in the world, if you have your best players available, you have the best chance of winning. Obviously, there's more that comes into that. You've got to prepare them properly and they've got to be in good shape. They've got to be organised so they know what they're doing in possession, out of possession, in transition. But if they're always training, coaches can educate the players. If they're always available, they're able to put into practice their, their abilities. So that was the, the strap line, if you like, in, in what we wanted to achieve. So this was a typical week. Um, it was very unique. We could have been playing in Seattle on the Saturday, travel to Toronto, play the midweek game on the Wednesday, back to Portland the following Saturday, then back across to New York. So we broke the week into... Um, a periodized week, if you like, but the principles were the most important thing. So the first principle was recovery. As I said, you could be playing, you know, a mile high in Colorado midweek, and then you've got a home game in, uh, you've got a, another away game in Houston in real intense heat and humidity, and then you had travel to that. So it was always about making sure players are fully recovered after, after the Saturday game. The second principle was making sure the players were always organised in terms of what, what the coach wanted them to do in possession, out of possession, in transition. So the, the two days leading to a game were always based on that. And then if the week permitted, that's when we'd start trying to improve the condition of the players. Obviously, a midweek game, you know, it's, it's more of a neutral week. If you played Sunday and then Friday, the two key principles were recovery and organisation. So it just depended whether we could fit that in. And then it was based on the week and based on the concept of periodization being fair, a fairly new concept, it was agreeing a set of rules of everything that we collectively do on the field, what those rules were and what those guidelines were. So as you can see, for each day, for each type of work, whether it be a warm-up, sprinting, sprinting exercise, technical, tactical, possession, conditioning, crossing and shooting, there were a set um, group of guidelines so that each day was slightly different and that players were always fresh going to games. Now, again, this took a, a little bit of time because for the players, sometimes we were restricting them a little bit and I hate the word restriction, but we'd had six or seven soft tissue injuries from shooting because the players would shoot every single day, multiple shots at the end of every session and we needed to rectify that. So. When I've got a void in those guidelines, it's not necessarily a void, but if it was using shooting as an example, include would be no holes barred because they're at the freshest. A void would be do it in a different way. Work on finishing, work on left and right foot volleys, work on headers, work on other aspects of a player's game. 
So I'm going to go through each each week and the structure, sorry, each day of the week and the structure of the, each slide is, is the same. So you've got a graph to show which day we're talking about. The, the light gray text is basically what coaches can expect from players or how coaches can expect players to be feeling. And then the black bold text is therefore what coaches should be doing for those players to, to keep them in balance. And then the, the sort of guidelines on the, on the right are typically what we would advise for that day. So after a game, and again, particularly when you throw all the traveling and the humidity and the altitude in, players are like to feel tired and may have experienced a poor sleep after a game. You know, they may have flown back and got back at three o'clock in the morning. So whilst the structured recovery session is ideal, it might be more advent advantageous for players to sleep in. It also gives them a change of environment to forget about the game, you know, spend time with family and friends. But it was still important to perform activity that encouraged blood flow and pay attention to nutrition. And that was that was one of the key things. There was not a great understanding of what nutrition was. So that was that was something that we needed to really home in on to start off with. So whether that be on a bike, going swimming, cycling, whatever it may be, we have lots, lots of lakes in Seattle, um, fairly nice weather throughout the year. So a lot of the players would go out on a boat, for example, and go and jump in the lake and take the kids swimming. So it was just trying to get across. That's a really good recovery mode. Also, it's important for them to understand the recommendations were after a game for balanced meals. So carbohydrate to replenish energy, protein to um, repair muscles, vitamins and minerals to extract the energy from the carbohydrates, um, and provide support for the immune system. Good fats to help with um, swelling and reduce inflammation, and then fluids to help them re rehydrate. So we basically said four meals every day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and, and an evening snack. So the Monday was typically off, and anyone that's, that's played will understand you're going to feel doms the day after the day after, so it's often the worst time. And that's basically your body telling you it's a critical period as, as it needs all energy going to help repairing itself. Also, you know, the message from the brain to the muscles and neural fatigue that is, you know, is, is quite apparent these days, it won't have fully recovered. So what's the point in unnecessarily flaring anything up? But again, it's, it was still important for them to understand nutrition for balanced meals and perform, go for a walk, go for a walk around the shopping center with, you, with your wife, get some blood flow, whatever that, that may be. So the first day back after the game was um, match day minus four. And again, some players may still be suffering from stiffness or the effects of knocks from the game, especially when you, you add travel and humidity and altitude, as I said, into all of that. They're likely to be least mobile and least flexible following that particular period. And it might take a little bit of time to get going. Anyone that, you know, the, the first session back is always, what's going on here? The, the quality is terrible. That's ultimately, ultimately telling you that the players are lacking in control and coordination. So the philosophy was to ease players back into the training. As, as you can see, the recommendations on the right-hand side were avoid anything really, really explosive. Still, still train at high intensity, but avoid maximum shooting. Avoid sessions where players are likely to get up to maximum speeds. Self-explanatory and, and fairly commonsensical. So... The, the first day back was also an assessment period for the practitioners. So as you can see here, this is just um, what we would potentially ask um, the, the players about how they're feeling. So, you know, what physically, where are they? Mentally, where are they? Soreness, sleep, nutrition. So we get an assessment of red, amber, green. And as you can see, this is actually um, from my time, my visual. Um, the visual is from my time at Wales, as you can see from all the names. But it's something that I've, I've found has been really useful, asking players how they feel. And when you put it in this context, you can see across the board if there's any common trends or there's random reds, you know, so you don't need to worry about that. It's the same thing for every player, but you still need to consider how you can rectify that ready for the next day. This, as I said, would be the time when we do, the first day back would be the time when we'd perform all the readiness assessments because as you saw from the, the visual of the training week, the Wednesday, the match day minus three is when we really want to push, push them. So 24 hours early, we'd look at, in comparison to the norms, internal and external rotation of the hip, for example, the range of movement. If they've got restricted range of movement and we want to really push them, at some point they may get into a position where 
their knee buckles or something else happens where we could have avoided that particular thing from happening. So we've got 24 hours to, to rectify, you know, a range of movement. The masseur may do a, a glute release or it might be that they do some exercise in the gym to, to help that. Things like um, glute and hamstring strength, we would look at if we want, if we're going to do a lot of sprinting, obviously you want the glutes and the hamstrings as strong as possible and no, no decrease compared to their norm so that we know we can, we can push them. Um, calf flexibility or ankle mobility, um, hamstring flexibility and back mobility, little things that take a very, very short period of time, but give you a lot of information to hopefully when you want to push them, you're confident that you've done everything to, and your due diligence to, to really push them. So that's what we would do on, um, on a match day minus four. Then when we come to the Wednesday, having done um, an easing session the day before, players should be completely fresh, having performed that light training session. Some players may still be reporting discomfort, but because it's a day further away from the game, it's less likely. And therefore, it's an ideal time to um, perform all the explosive actions and everything you really want to push them in. Um, one thing that was difficult to, to get across, particularly to the coaches, because they want to coach, is when it's a condition day, it's a condition day. The tactical side is a Thursday, Friday. And even though you're pushing players, you still want them to put into practice the, the, um, the things in possession, out of possession, in transition, all the things that you would want them to do, but you want them to be maximizing an 11-11 game or a 6v6 game or a 3v3 game. So the emphasis is it's important to limit the number of practices prior to that conditioning session because you're going to repeat it every week and you want it to be similar every week so you can increase the duration every week. One last thing we would do by way of a, a test to, to assure ourselves that we can really push the players is, is a count movement jump or a reactive strength index jump. And basically it's just telling you about the, the readiness of the neuromuscular system. And it's two jumps per player, on, you know, as you can see on the, on the jump platform. It just tells you whether there's any fatigue compared to normal, providing the players perform it at their maximum. Um, and it, it reassures you that Yes, the neural system is ready, the brain, a message from the brain to the muscles, so you can sprint them maximally, you can push them to the limits. And again, coupled with what we do the day before, we felt that that was something that, that kept players healthy and allowed us to, you know, to, to push players. So following the condition session, um, it was important to then taper down. So careful consideration needs to be given in order to maximize the training effect. So if you push them too hard the day afterwards, then you're not going to get the same train effect. Obviously, it's, it's very close to the game as well. So you want to gradually reduce the volume, the intensity, so that they're fresh going into the game. But some, some players may still feel a little tired. So if they push themselves the day before, albeit not as much as in, in a game. Um, and again, they might take time to get going. So it was really important to then perform, you know, any high intensity in any in short, short bouts. And similar to the first day back, it was just to get them moving again. Having done that and tapered off the Friday, it's always important that players feel good going into a game. So they should feel fresh and full of energy. If they're carrying anything from that match day minus three, then that would maybe tell us what we need to do for the following week. But having done a, a fairly light session the day after the conditioning session, they should be ready to perform all high intensity bouts um, normal and, and, and prepare themselves to play fast football the next day. And that's ultimately the, the, the training week. In terms of outcome, um, as I said, the manager and the general manager wanted us to improve player availability and increase physicality. The, the second season, so the 2019 season, when we won the MLS Cup, we had the highest player availability in, in the club's history. So hopefully the, the approach went, you know, went somewhat to, to contribute to that. After the, the terrible start of the season, we had the best half season in MLS history, and we went on a winning streak of nine straight wins, and I think we won 14 out of the last 16 games. Don't know how we won some of those games, but um, when you're on a roll, on a run, uh, you know, certain things happen. Then in 2019, we had the best start to, to the campaign, and therefore the best 25-game stretch. 
We won the Cascadia Cup. I've only put that in there. It's, it's a three three game tournament between Portland, Vancouver, and, and Seattle, the local local derby. But it sounds good when you cut winners two years in a row. Um, we won the Western Conference in LA, which no one expected us to. And then we beat Toronto in the uh, the MLS Cup at home in front of seventy two thousand fans at the at the CenturyLink Stadium, Seattle um, Seahawks Stadium which is one of the most experience, most amazing experiences I've ever had. You know, the, the crowd, you, you're on home turf, it's, it's the cup final, and uh, it, it was a great day. I've just put something together just to sort of recap everything I've talked about in the visual form um, that pretty much wraps up um, the case study. <laughs> First of all, Damien, um, massive thanks for joining us on our National Coaches Conference. A really insightful presentation and obviously congratulations on your fantastic work over the last sort of 20 years in, in the realm of sports science and um, in your role as head of performance. The first question, which probably relates a lot to our Welsh coaches, would be around how you integrate these principles into a part-time model, maybe training twice a week, like a Tuesday, Thursday. How would you ensure conditioning, but also you know managing recovery, but also managing that tapering process going into the next competitive game in a part-time basis? Um, first of all, has, has it really been 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> at least that day, at least that. Won't make me feel old. <laughs> um, good question. I think if, if I refer back to the visual of the a typical week, obviously if it's a Tuesday, Thursday, I would sort of advocate the Tuesday, Tuesday being the work day. And then the Thursday being the Thursday as it is in the, in the model, if you like. So your conditioning is on the Tuesday and then your lighter session, but still, you know, working on an element of intensity, but whilst organizing the team would be on your, on your Thursday without trying to contradict myself because you've only got two days to, um, to work in a part-time model. I would then still, I would then integrate some tactical work on both days. So I, I know I said, you know, your conditioning session is all about conditioning, but it's, it's a slightly unique, unique situation. So I'd integrate tactical work into both days. Well, and you, you're obviously very clear in terms of the models you presented. Um, how do you see the role, your role integrated in the sort of planning process um, and how the coaches sort of function and work those principles into the sessions that they deliver in terms of the principles and the tactics they deliver? From a technical tactical point of view but also respecting the physical layer i think it's it's difficult to ask, answer that question because every environment's different and every coaching staff is different if you know if the coaching staff and I, i'll allude to what i said about the staff particularly in the in the second season at seattle they they'd gone through the welsh course they understand they, they were covering tactical periodization so they understood principles of periodization it, I didn't need to be involved as much. So it was, they understood the principle of recovery, this, the structure of the week was in place. So that allowed recovery. They always did their tactical work Thursday, Friday. Um, and then it, it was a little bit of guidance in terms of more on an individual periodization from my perspective, in terms of older players, players with a big injury history, um, things like that, where when we're doing our conditioning part, it'd be right, this is what they need in comparison to the team. 
Um, but if you've got, you know, if you've got a relatively inexperienced staff and a group of coaches that don't really grasp sports science, I think it's imperative that that, that practitioner guides them in the process. It doesn't always happen because sometimes the coaches don't recognize their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Sometimes the practitioner doesn't always um, speak in the right language to get the message across where it's, it's a universal language and everybody understands what, what page it, um, the group are on. So uh, it's, I think it's just based on, on the situation and the, the, the scenario at, at each individual club. And knowing the quality of your work, obviously, you've always managed to get player buying across your career, I suppose, in terms of your, your way of working and, and this sort of methodology, I suppose. But how do you, I suppose, what's some of the take home messages to try and get player buy into this type of periodization model? Funny you should say that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about Craig Bellamy and when I, when I worked with him at Man City, he, um, he actually kept a day by day diary of everything we, we do, we obviously, first thing, first things first is introduce to the group, what, what your philosophy is, what you're doing, and more importantly, why you're doing it. And then what you anticipate the outcomes to be. So we, we did that at Man City and said, look, you're going to be available for more games. You're going to be able to improve your capacity over the course of the season, and you're going to finish strong. And that's the theory behind the model. So you present that. Craig, when we did that at Man City, was, um, and he won't mind me saying this, we've laughed about this many times, he, um, he kept a diary just so that he could say when he broke down, that's rubbish, that, that doesn't work, it's absolutely terrible. And then I remember him saying to me after the first couple of games when he'd, he'd done really well, he'd scored a couple of goals, he hadn't broke down, and he felt good. He showed me the diary and he said, I'm still, I've still got my doubts and I'll still have a chat with you in three months time if I'm still available. And ultimately, he was available all season. And that's just a little story that you've sometimes, you've sometimes you've got to live it. Mm. So you present and you, you tell the players. And again, it's, I've had everywhere I've been, there's been doubts. And oh, I, I want to feel tired. I want to feel as if I've worked. And then they've hit personal bests in the first three or four games and smashed the high intensity and sprint distance and felt, you know, not felt tired towards the end of the game and so on. So I think you've got to present it. You've got to allow them to live it. And then if you've um, sort of explained what you anticipate is going to happen and it happens, you've got to buy in. It doesn't always work like that, but that's, that's certainly how I've approached it. Brilliant. Thanks, Damo. You made a great point um, in your presentation about player availability, which is probably critical to all coaches' success. And you mentioned that yourself, that if players are available, then most, most time you've got a better chance of winning games. So fundamentally, it's a really important point. And your book, you've just recently published, sort of links into that, Fit for Every Game, um, and obviously I've read it myself, sent me a copy. Thanks for that. I really appreciate it. And it's something obviously we advocate on our coaching courses um, and something we'll definitely be putting into our coaching courses recommended reading. I think the book is very, very interesting in, in a point of view that it's obviously very much a practitioner's book, very much a coach friendly book. Um, and I think the way in which you put it across in those four sections, planning, prevention, conditioning and regeneration provides a great framework for coaches to, to read and understand. Uh, <laughs> the question really is around what sort of motivated you or inspired you to write this book, you know, given that it probably took you a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, but obviously that's my, my main question really. I think it's, it's, a, it's making a lot of mistakes. Um, and trying from those mistakes. So as you pointed out very, very nicely, I've been in the game 20 years, so I'm quite old by comparison to a lot of practitioners. Um, it was born out of when I was at Man City, um, it was at the time when the shape took over and the, every head of department was, was charged with the task to go and find out world leading experts, best practice, so on and so forth in your area. Mm. And I, I just tried to, I'm, I'm quite OCD, so I tried to strategically come up with, right, what, what is my world? What is my responsibility and my job description ultimately? And that's when I broke it up into planning, prevention, conditioning, regeneration, and then there's st three strands to each of those. Mm. So I had to start putting that together formally anyway, and just to determine what our department does and therefore how we evolve within that framework. So it was, it started then. And as I said, you evolve, you, there's new things that come into play. You make lots of mistakes. You try and learn from those mistakes. So it's an evolving process. 
So I just, wherever I went, I took that structure and strategy, if you like, with me, and it's just evolved ever since. And I, I, <clears throat> I noticed very quickly as I was going through the practical, the applied side, it's nothing like the theory. It's nothing like what you learn in your bachelor's degree or your master's degree or doctorate. It's, it's a totally unique situation. So I started thinking, well, I wish I'd known what I know now when I first started. And sometimes you have a lot of battles with coaches because you're trying to get across. My, my only um, aim is that they have all the players at their disposal. Mm. And I've worked with amazing coaches that grasp it. And I've worked with coaches that don't grasp it at all. And you have multiple injuries and it's a battle that you're going, why do you want players not to be available for you? So it was born out of a lot of things really and language is a key thing. I think coach education courses don't necessarily do a, a fantastic job of helping coaches understand in terms of the language of sports science. So it was really just trying to make everything as simple as possible and as practical as possible so that a new coach or an experienced coach can embrace periodization. And I think I put three different approaches, not just, just one approach in there. And then practitioners can also understand the coach's world and the coach's thinking. So everything that a strength coach does needs to fil filter into the pitch. Everything that a nutritionist or someone giving nutrition advice needs to filter into the type and intensity of work and the games and so on. Everything that the medical, the physios do needs to filter into what, what's going on on the pitch. So it's just trying to bring everything together and, and help people ultimately. Thanks, Damo. It's obviously a fantastic book, and um, I recommend anyone to, to pick it up and read it. Um, so, congratulations on the uh, on your work, obviously, and obviously a big congratulations on your on your work um, in putting this book together. So, um, other than that, Damo, it's been fantastic to, to host you here at the National Coaches Conference, and hopefully, look forward to seeing you in uh, in better times in person. And best luck with your with your work. Thanks, Damo. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Pleasure.